Today we're going to look at a small passage of scripture from uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, third chapter. First Corinthians, third chapter. I'll tell you at the outset here that uh, uh, this is a fairly common passage and I don't have any new or astounding insights into this passage. This teaching will, will be uh, more of a, a workmanlike teaching that will take the form of uh, exhortation to do what we know we should do. Encouragement uh, to do what we as believers truly want to do in our redeemed hearts. We have this treasure of the knowledge of God in earthen vessels. And uh, sometimes we don't follow through the way we want to. Before we get started, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, pray this morning for your blessing upon this service. Lord, I, I pray for myself that I would learn more what it is to sow to the Spirit, uh, to, uh, to live my life before you, making it about you, rather than about my desires, my dreams, my wishes. I just pray that you'll come near to all of us, draw us near, fill us with your, your love. Pray this in your holy name for your glory. Amen. So we'll begin by reading then a short passage, 1 Corinthians, third chapter. And I'm just going to read from 10 to 15. Third chapter, 10 through 15. What's going on in this chapter? Uh, the Corinthian church is... Um, loves to be split on issues. <laughs> and the particular issue Paul is addressing at this point is uh, some of them say, well, I follow Paul. I'm not interested in what Apollos says. Or I follow Apollos. What Paul says is maybe not that important. I follow Cephas. And of course, uh, Paul is telling them it's not like that. That uh, we're all servants. Paul, Apollos, uh, Cephas, we're servants. That the, uh, the whole, this whole thing is about God. And God is uh, the one that uh, we need to be seeking and building our life by. So let's begin reading at verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. Someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself, he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. After I, when I was a teenager, I think I was, well, I know I was a, a senior in high school. And I finally became aware of the fact that God loved me. And I opened my Bible, which to me pri prior to that had been kind of a closed book. Uh, I read, uh, to me it was a book of rules. And uh, with the indwelling Holy Spirit, this passage really thrilled me gave me hope. 
and it also was so challenging to me. So we're going to look at it today. I'm going to read uh, 10 and 11 again, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. We'll take it verse by verse. But the grace of, but the grace God has given me, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no man, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. First of all, I think it's fair for each of us to ask ourselves what foundation we're building our lives on. And let's not fool ourselves about this. It's way too important. Is Christ's death on the cross to pay for my sins and yours, is that what gives us hope that motivates us to do the things we do? How really sad if some are here believing that they are Christians because, hey, this is a Christian nation, or my family's always been Christian, or I go to church, I give money, I was baptized. I'm confirmed. I take communion. I'm a really nice person. How sad if there are any here that believe that that is uh, the foundation that we're to build our lives on. Now, listen to this kind of carefully. We're Christians. And we are building on this foundation that Paul is talking about. If, and only if, we have personally humbled ourselves before holy God. <clears throat> Confessed our need of Christ's work on the cross for us. We Christians have acknowledged that we fall short. That's who a Christian is. It's not somebody who thinks he's better than everybody else. It's somebody who has acknowledged in his heart of hearts that he falls short, that he cannot possibly save himself. And we humbly accept, we humbly accept God's great gift of eternal life. I don't know why I can never get these things to work. Put it down further. Let's try this. Maybe that'll help. So this is the foundation that Paul is talking about, our confession of Jesus Christ as Lord, our acknowledgement of our sin and need. So, how am I building on this foundation? How are you building? Because this thing is personal. <coughs> God wants a, this relationship with each and every individual. Uh, we don't slip in because our grandpa was a preacher or our grandma was a, a prayer warrior. That doesn't do it. Uh, it's personal. So, going ahead, we're believers here. We have hopefully all put our trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. So the question before us is, how are we building on this foundation? How am I building? How are you building? It's personal. Let's, lead, let's read a little further. We'll read 12 and 13. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. The day will bring it to light. What day? What day are we talking about? It's a day. It's a day of judgment that is coming upon all believers. Theologians call this particular day of judgment the Bema judgment. Not important to remember that. Just know that it's not a judgment that determines whether you go to heaven or hell. This is a judgment uh, it's a different judgment than that. It's a judgment on what we have done, what we Christians have done in our lives. Whether our work was for our comforts, our plans only, 
or whether they were for Christ's kingdom as well. I want to read 14 and 15 real quick. If what he has built survives, if what we've built on this foundation of salvation in Christ survives, he will receive his reward. It, if, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So, here's a reality that uh, we don't like to think about. That's reality nonetheless. All of us have a judgment in our future. It's coming. This is a judgment of works we have done in this body. Salvation is not involved in this judgment because Paul says he shall be saved. So our ultimate salvation is not involved in this judgment at all. It's not a, just, a judgment on our persons. Our bodies are not tortured. Um, this notion of purgatory or whatever is, is completely a, an unbiblical concept because Jesus paid it all. It's a judgment only on our works that determines our rewards. This judgment determines our rewards in heaven, if any. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. J. Brennan McGee, an old-time preacher, once said, although saved, many people are going to smell like they were bought at a fire sale when they get to heaven. Everything they did here on earth, they did in the flesh. They did it for some earthly reason, for some present satisfaction. Uh, I, I hope that doesn't describe our life. That everything we do is for some present satisfaction. May we live in such a way that much of what we do while in this body is for a heavenly reason or all. Are we going to face our or rather, we are going to face judgment for the works we have done while in this mortal body. Now, this says, and we just read it, if our works burn, we'll be saved. But we will, listen, think about this. If we go there having lived for ourselves, for our comforts, for our satisfaction, and we we go to this judgment of works and our works burn. We will stand before our God, our Lord, who gave everything for us and we won't have anything to honor him by, 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 way, of, uh, by way of thanks for what he had done. And I know I don't want that and I know you don't want that. We want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, my hope and expectation for all of us is much better than, than the result of this fellow here that, whose works are burned up who will enter heaven smelling of smoke. My hope and expectation for all of us is much better than that. We want to be building on the foundation of our salvation with gold, silver, and precious stones. And that leads us very naturally to this question. How? <laughs> what is the path that ensures that we are building gold, silver, precious stones for the king? Well, uh, it begins with brokenness, I think. I'm sure. Psalm 51, 17 reads like this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. 
So, as we consider further how to build our foundation of, of salvation with gold, silver, or precious stones, let's do a little review of the first few verses of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to let Christ tell us how to build on this foundation. So let's turn to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Pastor Dan just did a wonderful job on this not too long ago, so this is going to be a review for many. And we're going to begin with verse 3. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If we are believers today, if we are believers today, it's because this is true for us, or at least it was true for us, um, the day that we trusted in Christ. Uh, the, big, the day that we began our new life in Christ. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? I think we're poor in spirit when we glimpse even a little the staggering distance between God's holiness, God's righteousness, and ours. Uh, that humbles us. That causes us to realize that we are poor in spirit. When we understand that even, when we begin to understand that even a little, that's when we see our own righteousness as fil filthy rags. And also, this verse doesn't say, blessed are those who at one time were poor in spirit. No, we, we live our lives out, our Christian lives out, poor in spirit. We live our lives out in brokenness and humility that's what God asks of us and it's only sensible verse 4 blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are those who see their spiritual brokenness and need and secondly mourn it we don't just say oh it's the way I am God made me this way uh, we mourn When our brokenness is more than just a theological statement, when it's more than just a head knowledge, when in our heart of hearts we own it, we are broken, we are needy, then we will be comforted according to this verse. God responds by showering us with grace and acceptance. I remember when I, now everybody's conversion experience is different, but when I first realized that God loved me, ah, the, uh, the knowledge of his acceptance of me was uh, staggering. It changed everything. And I know that uh, everyone has a story of, of what it was like to find themselves in relation with Holy God and find Him accepting them just as they are. It's wonderful. Blessed are those who mourn their spiritual poverty, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is to be a hallmark of the Christian world. Because no one who is broken before God goes around acting like a big deal. <laughs> it's quite simple. Uh, we know who we are. We know our needs. Uh, that, that keeps us in a state, I believe, of meekness. Now, this type of meekness is not a cringing thing where we're afraid to uh, insert ourselves into any situation. Uh, I think the life of Jacob kind of uh, displays this 
at least for me, in a way that was really meaningful. Jacob, if you remember, was one of the 12 patriarchs in the Old Testament. And that guy was a cheater. <laughs> he was a liar. He, uh, he was not to be trusted with him. He, he actually, not only in a spiritual sense, he actually physically wrestled with God. He was an ornery character. When he, by the time he got to be an old man, remember his son Joseph is now in, in Egypt. And he's, he's a big wheel in Egypt. He's saved the country and the famine that has overtaken the land. And after Joseph uh, uh, becomes a great ruler in Egypt, he sends for his papa. And he brings him to Egypt. He brings his dad, his own father, before the pharaoh of Egypt. Now this is one of the most powerful men on the planet. And Jacob walks in there. And he, he makes this statement. Uh, he says, few and evil been the days of my sojourn, and I have not attained to the years of my fathers. And then the scriptures goes on to say that Jacob blessed the Pharaoh. The Hebrews 7.7 7 tells us, it is without question the lesser is blessed by the greater. So meekness is, is humility, it's brokenness, but with a strong sense of who we are because of our relationship to holy God. Jacob walked in there after a life of struggle and fighting God, and God had brought him to a place of humility and brokenness. But he was able to stand before one of the most powerful men on the planet and bless him. That's meekness. It's not a cringing, fearful little guy. It's somebody who is humble, yet know who they are because they're of their relationship with the living God. Verses six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And here I think is where our uh, Christian disciplines begin to come in. Our Bible reading, our prayer, our gathering together, our giving, uh, fasting, disciplining of the body in, in, in subjecting it to uh, our will so that we can serve God rather than ourselves. This is where these Christian disciplines come in. We hunger, we thirst for righteousness, and if we do, we will be filled. And this will affect our outward behavior in this world. And that leads us to seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they should be shown mercy. Our outward, this, this, uh, Hungering and thirst after righteousness works itself out in, in our merciful behavior toward other people. We don't sit there, as I have often, watching the TV and seeing someone dancing in the streets because they've just murdered thousands of people in, in our country, and rage. I found myself full of hate at that moment. But these people are, are deceived and they do not. We have no business raging at them. We want these folks to come to know our God the way that he has revealed himself to us. Uh, we have this treasure of this knowledge of God's love for us in earthen vessels. And sometimes it's, it's, it's hard 
to live the way that we're called to live. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are you and I when uh, what people see is who we are. We're not something other than we appear to be. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, this is all things that work out uh, from this uh, desire to be righteous and this uh, seeking after righteousness. Now let's read 10, 11, and 12 real quick. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Our godly behavior will quite possibly result in some of the same things that happen to our Lord. Persecution. Insult. And that's because godliness makes the children of this world uncomfortable. <laughs> if you've ever noticed that at work, because you live in a certain way, because your speech is in a certain way, uh, you, uh, you make a lot of people uncomfortable. So, be ready for that. Sometimes persecution or, or censure or, you know, the fact that the people around you are uncomfortable with you there sometimes, sometimes that causes us to fall back. We're encouraged in this book to not grow weary and well, do we? Uh, thinking about falling back because of uh, because of hard times or or persecution or kickback, whatever. Uh, last week, Chet, Rachel, and uh, Nehemiah and Miriam. Now, if for those of you who don't know, that's my daughter and her husband and my two little grandchildren, two and four. Uh, Nehemiah, they all arrived at church last Sunday. They, they're out in Grand and South Dakota. They all arrived in church last Sunday sporting their colors, green and gold. <laughs> and uh, the pastor was a, was a Viking fan. And he saw this little guy puffed up, proudly displaying his colors. And he said, Nehemiah, Packers are gonna lose. Oh no, Packers are gonna win. Vikings are gonna lose. And uh, this went back and forth because you know, we at adults, we love to do that, don't we? These little guys are so cute. And uh, of course that was a, if you remember, that was a night game. So he didn't get to see it on TV. He went to bed. But early the next morning, he ran into Mama's room. And he said, what was the score? And Mama said, well, the Vikings won. <laughs> and of course, there's no one that can do drama like a four-year-old. I won't even try. <laughs> it was great. And, uh, the agony was, was deep, it was hard. And he went around the house there for quite some while, all down. Oh, you know, the world's over, I was lost. Uh, but then he came back in the room, he had himself composed. He said, Mom, let's go to the store and buy some Viking gear. <laughs> So I, uh, yeah, uh, 
see how I turned this whole message into uh, not falling back if you're a Packer fan <laughs> in the face of adversity? Uh, no. Life is full of troubles. Life is full of trials. But if we have this solid foundation, and if we are committed to building on it, gold, precious stone, silver, uh, we go on and we go on honoring our Lord and pleasing Him in the way we walk. So, what is the path we take to ensure that we build on this foundation of salvation in Christ alone with gold, silver, and precious stones? It's a path of humility. It's fearing to leave our place of utter dependence upon God because we understand a little of our brokenness. It starts with brokenness and humility. And we walk in this world meekly, but with a strong sense of who we are and how we are loved, how we are treasured. And we serve each other and those around us out of a heart following his leading obeying his commands. His desires for us become our desires. They're more important than our desires for ourselves. And we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com.